thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm looking forward for the questions of Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> no, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, so as many as you know, uh, uh, j you just uh, mentioned uh, J.C. Jakobsen, uh, the founder of the Carlsberg Foundation. He designed this building uh, like himself. I mean, I, I've been, I actually was around because I got lost before coming here. <laughs> and um, it's very interesting to look at the architecture. And uh, the Danish, uh, or at least the Danish I know, have a special ability to design environments uh, that inspire people to share ideas and deepen the human connectivity. The Carlsberg Academy is one of those places. But there's another one that I know and I wanted to tell you about. Uh, it's actually in Brussels. It's called the Library in Brussels. And uh, there's a woman called Anne-Sophie van der Born uh, She is a Danish entrepreneur and she's the founder of this Danish library. It's a chain of co-working spaces which have seen really great success in Brussels and you should visit. And Anne-Sophie, what she does she creates a little bit like here, this kind of elegant, inviting, uh, light-filled spaces like we have here, designed to be kind of an antidote to the blandness of the office life. But for her, the library is much more than a beautiful office space. It's a home to a thriving community of individuals and small businesses who can uncover new opportunities together. And Anne-Sophie says that she's creating spaces where people can build trust. The minister was saying our society here in Denmark is based on trust. And uh, when I talked to her, she said something, now I'm quoting Anne-Sophie, she said, trust frees you to think differently. You are able to let go of the concerns that make you less productive, like Will that person steal my idea? Or will they take my client? Or what am I doing here if these people are actually doing something against me? And these meaningful encounters uh, at work really can inspire us. They make us happy, they give us ideas, they lead us to new partnerships." Unquote. What I take from Anne-Sophie's words is that Danes understand two things about innovation that I also really believe very strongly. The first is that bringing people together, it's not enough. You know, we have a lot of uh, programs in the European Union where we decided that we want to be people collaborating. And we just say, collaborate. You do a philosopher and an anthropologist and a sociologist, and then, at the end of the day, nothing happens. So you have to create the kind of environment that encourages people to work together and to try new things. This has to come bottom up and not top down. And innovation requires that, requires that openness. The second is that the future is about networks and new partnerships in the intersections of sectors and disciplines. And this is, I think, something that will be the biggest change that you'll see in universities uh, for the next 50 years, is that it's not going to be about the department, it's not going to be about the discipline, it's not going to be about the professor, it's not even be about the name of the degree. Sometimes people ask, what are you? I mean, I'm a civil engineer. What's that? I've never been a civil engineer in my life. I've learned my life afterwards to do something different and I was in the private sector for a long time. And so Anne-Sophie uh, is creating uh, in uh, Brussels these networks among people who would normally never share the same office space. This is the kind of networks, of parallel networks and partnerships that we should be building between European universities businesses, policymakers, and citizens. And innovation needs that, needs that connectivity. I think that if you look about what Europe needs, I think that Europe really needs a political sentiment of solidarity that we're not seeing there today, and an economic pillar of connectivity. And so I would like to go through two particular points uh, this morning with you. 
First is about how can we turn research and innovation into productivity growth. And second, I'd like to consider the innovation environment we need to create for Europe's knowledge economy to thrive. But let's start with productivity. There are a few places that I've visited, and you know that I visit a lot of places that are as committed to investing in research and innovation as Denmark. Uh, I know that Charlotte was asking uh, the question to the minister, but um, I visit very few places where you have an investment that is above 3% of uh, the GDP. And Denmark is one of those places. So I really commend Denmark not really only for reaching, but surpassing the EU target for research and development. And Denmark is actually the place where the ingredients are there. You have excellent research. I was looking yesterday into the numbers and uh, Denmark is on the top two of the highly cited scientific papers in Europe. So what you do is excellent. The research that you produce is excellent. And yet, somehow, Denmark's strength in science and research is not translated into productivity. Across the EU, there has been hardly any increase in productivity since the crisis in 2007. And as I see it, the main reason for this stagnation is that in the digital age, productivity does not diffuse from the top to the bottom. There is a very interesting study of the OECD about it. And you see that in the OECD countries, you see that the productivity has been growing at the top. For the top, I mean companies like the Carlsberg uh, company or the great companies, the big companies, what we call the frontier companies. But then those at the bottom are not getting the trickle down of that productivity. And so the average is stagnating. It's like the winners take it all. And so there seems to me here to have or to be in a world where we have two disconnects. One is between fantastic research in Denmark or in Europe and the economic impact of that research. And one between the big companies and the small companies. And this troubles me as someone whose job is to advocate higher member states' investment in research and development. And so my question every day is, why is this? What can be done to change it? And Denmark is extremely good at investing in what it knows well. Companies and business which should do well in Denmark are often trusted household names. But the nature of innovation is changing. The new economic opportunities of this century are increasingly emerging from the intersections of the digital and the physical world, as we've seen in the videos uh, there from China. So we have to ask, is Denmark, and indeed Europe, ready to make these changes? How willing are we to encourage new entrants to test out our new ideas and to allow the users to take control. Are we capable of a new design for innovation? Those are the questions that we have to answer. And this brings me to my second point. Solving the issue of productivity requires creating the right environment for innovation to have an impact. And to meet their Really, there are three areas that can make a difference for me. So if I want the productivity to go up, if I want really to connect, I have to work, I think, in three areas. And those are the three areas that I think are fundamental for the ecosystem. So first, we need to be able to scale up new businesses. Because this disconnect in between the big and the small is probably because we're not scaling up the small as we should. So we have to invest in that scale up. Second, we need to remove 
remove regulatory uncertainty, and we talked about it. So we need better regulation for innovation. We have to think about what will be the regulation of the future. Is it going to be the regulation that we have today? I don't think so. And we need to get public support for innovation right, so we need new ways to help our innovators. But let's start by the first point about investment. In 2014, venture capital investments across the European Union were around 5 billion euros. In the United States were 26 billion. In a small, small country in the Middle East, surrounded by war, there was almost 5 billion. That country is called Israel. And we have 500 million people. So that is a weakness of Europe. That is a weakness, by definition, of Denmark, but a weakness of all of us. And the, despite the strengths that you have and that we have in Europe of innovation, venture capital investments are actually below the European average. And so at the EU level, we are working hard to address this issue at the most practical way possible. And I've decided to go through a project that I don't know that I'll be able to make it. Um, and so uh, um, uh, it's a project of looking how can we create a venture capital fund of funds for Europe. And that came from two points. The first, that our industry is small, our industry is fragmented, a lot of this venture capital funding is public. Uh, before the crisis there was like 16% of the venture capital was actually public, now it's 32 or 34%. And so that public funding is very national. So no one is doing cross-border deals because they do it in their own country because it's the taxpayers of that, of that country. And so we went around looking at venture capitalists and we asked, what do you need? What's wrong? What can we do differently? And they said two things. One, that um, it's not in Europe the difficulty of creating a company, it's uh, difficult of the journey of the gaps in that journey when you go from 10 million to 20 million to 30 million and then at, you get at 50 million and no one can invest because if the average fund in Europe is 60 million, if I need 60 million, a fund will not invest 60 million because that's the size of the fund. So you have to have something bigger. And so we decided that or we can have something that is private management and not public management because we have venture capital with public management that is in between 500 million and 1 billion then we will do something different. We can help those scale-ups and those people that actually come to me and say they can't get financing here and they go to the United States. And so that's what we're working on, is actually on this venture capital fund of funds. But if we can't make it, we are just launching a call of expression of interest to general partners, to private general partners. And if the general partners come to us and say that they're not interested, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to, I mean, it's the taxpayer's money. So I do it if it makes sense. The other point they said is that the public money has to be a minority of the money and not a, a majority of the money, which I agree uh, also that it should be a minority and that should be really a private venture. So that would bring an entirely new momentum to the European venture capital market and increase investor confidence. The second point that I wanted uh, to mention to you, which comes on this problem of how to get the productivity diffusing from the top to the bottom, is about regulation. We live in a world where the insiders are okay. I mean, the great companies that come to visit me and that, very, that are very big, they normally come in asking me for more regulation, not for less, because that protects them, but doesn't protect the rest. And so we had uh, an idea uh, to copy an idea from the Dutch government called the Green Deals. And we call that the Innovation Deals. And so what we did uh, was basically uh, to create this idea of the Innovation Deals at the European level. What am I talking about uh, with these Innovation Deals? I think that regulation today has two problems. One that is very static. 
So I'm regulating things that I don't know that will exist or not. I'm regulating products that will probably never exist in the future. And regulation is done just by politicians. And so the innovation deals is about you have a problem, you send us what is the problem, and you come to us. We sit down around the table with the national authorities, with the European authorities, with the regulator and the entrepreneur. And we look, what's the problem? Should we do something about Is it a problem of regulation? And one of the things that uh, um, the Dutch learned, and I think that is a very interesting take, and it was something that really wanted me, made me go ahead with the idea, is that in Europe we have a big problem of perception. If you see there's a negative perception that the regulation is too bad, that uh, people cannot do and go on with their businesses. And on the cases that the Dutch did, in 70% of the cases, they didn't have to change the regulation. It was a question of perception. The entrepreneur was so afraid of the uncertainty, was so afraid that he will not abide by the law, that he was giving an interpretation to the law that it was much tougher and rigid than it actually was. And so the innovation deals uh, will be exactly about that. And I would like to encourage uh, the innovators in Denmark to consider submitting a case for innovation deals by the 15th of September. And, and so together we can remove legal uncertainty so that the Danish innovation reach the market and contributes to Europe, especially in the field of uh, what we call the circular economy, because we had to start by a pilot, and so we're starting these on what we call the circular economy. And that will also put the citizens closer to Europe, because it's important that the citizens talk with the national governments and then talk with the European authorities and see, is it a problem of a European directive? Is it a problem of Europe? I, I think that, you know, I've been really thinking these past couple of days of how can you be close to the citizens to explain. I mean, sometimes we do things wrong, but let's face it and, and say it was wrong. But sometimes it's not wrong and people think we're doing things wrong. So we have to be very, very close to people when doing regulation. And I think this will be a different way of doing it. And finally, this brings me to the third area, which is the public support. Generating productivity from innovation is about more than investment and regulation. It's also about attitudes. And it's about environment for innovation that we create. Right now, the Commission is questioning whether we are willing to share the risks with Europe's innovators. We are asking, are we supporting a wide enough diversity of innovators? Is there trust in the services we provide? And the conclusion that uh, we have, or actually that we came through a public consultation, and some of you have uh, eventually participated, was that we are not doing the right thing. And we are not doing the right thing because we are not grasping what Clayton Christensen calls the market-creating innovation because our programs are too vertical, are too top-down oriented. And so I believe that Europe can have a more meaningful relationship with the innovators. And when I launched this idea of a European Innovation Council, and I want to reassure the Danish government is not about any kind of institution with building, with spending money, it's not about that. Um, it's about creating new rules, it's about changing the rules of the game, that you can grasp the people that are not coming to us. I go to a lot of startups that don't even know about the European programs, and probably that's nice, I mean, if they can do otherwise, I'm happy f for them to do that, but sometimes they could and they don't know those programs, and those two programs don't fit them. Because these new uh, innovators they are not the ones of the past that were like engineers or are um, uh, doctors or are from physics. They come from all over. And when they come to our programs that are too top down and we're telling them to, no, no, you have to innovate specifically on nanotechnology on this field. 
they don't know what to do because that's not what they are. They come from fields that are different and they come in a different way. So the idea is to create programs or to change the rules of the current programs to have a different approach. And so we're gonna, I'm going to talk to very soon to all the ministers in Europe about we have a very interesting program called the SME instrument for SMEs. And that program has topics, very focused topics like energy on this field or uh, uh, chemistry. And we want to do something different. Let's do a call with no topics. Let's just say, look, come to us, tell us what you think you can do, tell us what uh, really uh, are important. And so I'm very happy that um, <coughs> Uh, certain uh, of the Danish organizations and universities took part of helping me on these. Um, I wanted to quote uh, uh, something from Aros University that said, a clear pro-innovation and business-minded mentality is required to succeed. And they continue, and a willingness to develop and test new instruments is desirable to overcome the valley of death and the need to leverage more private investment in high risk research in innovation projects. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is certain that Europe will benefit from Denmark's collaboration in the design of a 21st century environment for innovation with your experience, with your history. But it's just certain that we'll achieve very little without trust, solidarity, diversity and a common vision. Europe, more than ever, needs your help. We need to look into the future and think, what can we do differently? And I think that we're going through a period where it's not about rationality, it's about emotions, and it's about how you create this environment with the innovators that they feel that Europe is helping them. So Europe does not and will never think and act as an homogeneous whole, nor should that be our goal. Our goal should be to make the very most of our unique and enviable situation. We are different, and yet we work remarkably well together. We have succeeded in creating peace and prosperity like no other political or economic project in the history of mankind. For the ones that, like me, lived a long time abroad, outside of Europe, and I probably, I hope I'm not going to shock anyone here, but every time I lived in the United States, I felt very European. <laughs> and the other day I was thinking, what was that? Why did I feel so European? Why my friends were mostly Europeans from different, different countries? <clears throat> from my, one of my best friends was Finnish. I'm from Portugal, I was like, it's very far. And I think that there's things that really we think in a different way. We are much more balanced when you think about the individual or the collective uh, than other parts of the world. We want a balancing between the collective and, and the individual. We are, I mean, I'm much more less tolerant to inequality than in other parts of the world, and we all are in our countries. And then when I think about my home country of Portugal in the 70s and in the 80s, I think the big change that uh, Europe got us was not the roads or the infrastructures, was actually that got us this sensitivity about the environment, about the climate, about sustainability. That is very European. And so I think that rather uh, than thinking about what actually divides us and the differences, I think we should about what actually makes us together. So let's trust in ourselves, let's continue to embrace our differences and let's work towards a common vision, a new design for a European innovation based on openness and connectivity. Thank you very much. Oh, I have a question. <laughs> Thank you so much. In a way, one of the things you said um, sort of echoes some of the problems that the EU is having right now. This, uh, you said something is too top-down mm -hmm. and that you have to make it more flexible. How much control are you as a commissioner and the EU Commission willing to give up 
in relation to the programs? I mean, how free can you set things? How much control are you giving up to make innovation bloom better? First of all, I think that there's a lot I can do by myself with the support of all the ministers around the table uh, when we have these uh, quarterly meetings. And I've had uh, support from all of them in terms of this idea that we have to be more bottom-up on our programs. And so uh, I think it's not even a question, um, you know, in innovation and science is one of the things that everybody is united around the table. And I think that sometimes we should use science and innovation to do bridges uh, in between the countries that we're not doing in other uh, fields. And so on that, on that matter, I think we, we have a lot. I mean, I have freedom to do uh, a lot uh, because this program, Horizon 2020, which is the biggest program in the world in terms of science and, and innovation, is almost 80 billion euros for seven years. Uh, it's a program that is managed directly by the Commission with the universities, with the companies. And it's not based on any kind of political decision. You know, all uh, the matters, I have no influence uh, at all in terms of deciding one project on another. It's done by experts. It's done by people that we get from different countries that evaluate. And that's why it's so successful, because it's actually what Europe should do adding value through getting the excellence at the top. Uh, and this program is about that excellence. Where are the best people? Where, what are they doing? Uh, can we actually uh, give them money to do better? And that's, uh, that's extremely, I mean, it's, it's really one of the best tools we have in Europe and, and one of those that unites people around the table. Right. Any questions from the floor? Mess, could we get a microphone over here? Thank you. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, thank you for excellent lecture, uh, Mr. Commissioner. Now, in my field, I'm Mads Krosko from Novo Nordisk, which is a pharmaceutical company, and I'm head of R&D. There are many, many hurdles for us to succeed in the European market. And <coughs> I'm not afraid of my company, but you mentioned the fear that all the innovation doesn't trickle down the value chain to the small companies. And universities are responsible nationally for making the spin out of research into innovative small companies easy. So that's, of course, not your task. But then there are two other hurdles. One is the regulatory approval of your product, and that goes whether it's a medicine or an app or whatever. And the next is the adoption nation by nation. And I'll, I'll actually ask you a rather uh, naughty question because I know everything is going towards Europe is too centralized. But I would actually suggest to you that small companies almost never make it in Europe because each nation has their own technology assessment country by country. Yeah. I would actually suggest to some extent more centralization. So when a UA European regulatory authority approves a product, mm -hmm. it also makes maybe a generic technology assessment so that the company doesn't have to make 27 or 28 different ones and versions yeah. for each country. So it's just a suggestion, more centralization, and then you can always discuss prices with the individual countries. I don't know if you have comments. No, I mean, you, you touched upon the, the biggest problem we have in a digital world. Uh, I mean, you live in a world where you need speed and scale if you are a company. And uh, Europe is fragmented. And so uh, the comment uh, that you just uh, telling me, I think it's what kills it because People have to create a company in one uh, create a company in one country, and then they have to respect regulations in another country. The other day, I was with a nice uh, an ice cream producer. I'm not going to say the, the brand that told me for the same ice cream, he had to respect 20 weight different weights of salt and sugar in different countries. And I said, that's not possible. So you have to do 28 different ice creams. Uh, why is that? I mean, oh, because local regulations. And and I think that those kind of examples uh, are very talkative about uh, things that uh, if you could just like lower down that barriers, the companies would grow and they'll grow in Europe and they would not have to go to other parts uh, of the world. So yes, I think that in terms of uh, lowering down those <coughs> barriers, uh, we have a lot of work to do. And it's very, uh, it's very difficult because politically, if you say that, uh, in your own countries, you say that and you say, oh, that's more Europe. But it's m more good Europe. 
I mean, it's not, I mean, more good Europe in a sense that you don't have those barriers and so you can do better and you can sell more and you can have more jobs. Uh, and so that's the things. But that, that, that confused with more control, uh, which I think Europe should be doing those big things and not the small ones. I mean, like uh, President Juncker normally says. Uh, but it, it, takes, uh, it takes a lot of uh, uh, effort because the devil is on the details. Are there any initiatives going in this direction from the Commission coming up? In terms of, yeah, we have, I mean, the biggest uh, task uh, that we have is uh, the whole uh, task of Vice President Timmermans in terms of uh, better regulation, in terms of reducing, uh, I don't know if you uh, have the idea that since we've uh, been in office, the number of initiatives that were sent to Parliament that used to be in uh, several hundreds, uh, 200, 300 a year, and now are up to 23, 23, 24. So uh, the number of legislation is reducing and we at the same time can actually look, we have a platform called Refit, where uh, you look at the legislation that is in place and you see, does it make sense? Is it something that we should be doing? Is it something that should be done at the national level? Why is Europe bothering with this or not? So that's the kind of Europe that nobody is talking about. Um, because it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's boring for a news anchor to say these things. I think it's very I interesting. Know. I don't know. No, but you know, that there's also that, is that sometimes these kind of really important details of doing the obvious, they are not the ones that will make the, um, the newspapers or make the TV show of 8 p.m. or 7 p.m. Different, uh, in different countries because they are, uh, they are the ones that are technical but are important for Europe. So we have to find a better way to make it a little bit uh, more to, uh, in a better way, communicate in a better way, uh, I, I would say. And, and I think that uh, also journalists have to help us on that. Let's uh, see good. what happens if you improve your communicative skills or we sort of change our priorities. Thank you so much, Carlos Muedas. I'm uh, yeah. sorry we don't have more time for more questions.